This episode of Literary Treks is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 150,000 titles for your desktop or mobile device. To get a free audiobook of your choice, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. Also, help us keep Star Trek discussion coming to you each day by becoming a Trek FM patron through Patreon. Get access to exclusive content and become part of the team. You'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Trek FM. Hey everyone, I'm Rod Roddenberry, and you're listening to Trek FM. taking all these books? I thought I'd take some light reading, in case I got bored. Welcome everyone to Trek FM's dedicated books and comic show. I am just one of the hosts here. My name is Matthew Rushing, and I am joined by some esteemed gentlemen, men of renown and honor. First of these, Dan Gunther. Forsooth, Sir Matthew, I bid thee welcome. I thinketh thee looketh nice. <laughs> <laughs> did people back then really talk fancy or did they all just have a lisp i'm i'm never quite sure <laughs> <laughs> that's probably what it was like and the people wrote it down and it sounded like thee and thou and all that but it was really just a lisp so um that or you know too much uh whiskey or something at the local pub whatnot but uh another man of honor and valor bruce gibson thank you if for having me if here if today if if you are welcome if you almost feel like i'm talking like thindy brady from the brady bunch (laughs) (laughs) because in the first season there was a whole episode dedicated to her talking like a baby and she didn't like that and buddy henson was picking on her for that but that's a whole nother podcast (laughs) yeah that uh marcia 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 just for everybody to know i'm a huge brady bunch fan just like star trek i can talk brady bunch all night coming soon to the trek fm network (laughs) (laughs) yes you should start a podcast called marcia marcia (laughs) marcia i love it. a brady bunch podcast there you go let's pitch it to christopher i love it (laughs) oh man we are rocking and rolling well uh We're glad to have Dan back from his super secret Section 31 mission. Uh, So, uh, Dan, I hope it was successful. It's so secret, I'm not even sure what I was doing. That's how many levels deep of secrecy Section 31 is all about. So were you inceptioning someone, or are you just inceptioned? It's possible. I mean, you know, the stuff they had me doing, I had no idea what was going on. It's crazy. Oh, I've had nights Mm. like that, too. (laughs) <laughs> this might have just been a wild bachelor party or something <laughs> i'm not sure like. uh it does kind of sound like a klingon bachelor party or at least we think we know what a klingon bachelor party is like anyway the hangover. guys <laughs> oh goodness that would be funny the klingon hangover films yes somebody needs to make that fan film i'd watch that they open that the trunk and brilliant. alexander runs out naked what is going oh, on oh god see we are just Ah, oh, we're just on fire. So let's, before we ruin the streak, we should probably just talk about a little bit of news that we've got here. And uh, something that came out over at uh, San Diego Comic-Con that we didn't cover, but uh, we wanted to mention, and I think is really cool. Uh, they're going to be doing a second Green Lantern Star Trek new series, uh, Kelvin Timeline Crossover. And guys, I have to say, you know, I love the first one, so I'm super excited to see this happening again. Yeah, this is really cool. Like, as we talked about with the previous issue in this story, it's really unique in that it leaves the status quo as, you know, the Lantern Corps are in the Star Trek universe now. So obviously, we're not going to see that play out outside of this. But the fact that it's getting a sequel is really, really cool. Yeah, it's uh, I think it's exciting because I think it proves how well the first one did. And it must have gotten a lot of good reactions for them to do a second one. So that's very encouraging that the first one works so well that they're actually going to do a second. So hats off to you guys or rings on to you guys or whatever you would say. I think it's awesome. 
Well, I'm I'm just glad that uh, we're getting this, and I have to say too, you know, since that time, I've been reading more Green Lantern, and so I'm even more excited to see what happens now because I have even more familiarity with the universe. And so, uh, in fact, I have a, a few graphic novels uh, from the Green Lantern series waiting to be read when I can find the time. So uh, I'm looking forward to this immensely. Uh, now, that is the only thing that we have in news. It, it's been a slow week, but that's to be expected. I don't think we'll be getting anything out of Star Trek Las Vegas is going on as we record this. I don't think there's going to be any book news coming out of that. But uh, as we lament not being there, Dan, just kind of let everybody know where they can find Literary Treks and Trek FM online. Well, Literary Treks is just one of the many podcasts that we have here on Trek FM. There are shows on the network covering all corners of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user and use iTunes, be sure to hit that subscribe button and leave us a star rating and a review. This really helps us rise in the search results on iTunes and makes it possible for more Star Trek book fans to find us. And especially this weekend with the Las Vegas convention happening, a lot of people are going to be looking for all things Star Trek, so that would really help us out. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find the shows on Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, and of course you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website and grab the RSS link there as well. If you'd like to get into contact with us, we have a form on the website at trek.fm slash contact. You can leave us a voicemail there as well. Just look in the sidebar on the show page or go to speakpipe.com slash trek.fm. We're on Twitter at trek.fm and on Facebook at facebook.com slash trek.fm. While you're on Facebook, check out the Babel Conference. That's our listeners only group. Just type the Babel Conference into the search field on Facebook or go to our website at trek.fm and click discussion on the menu bar. Special for Literary Treks, we have the Goodreads group, where you can find bookshelves with all of our previously covered books, as well as what we're currently reading, so you can keep up to date with what's coming up for future shows. And there are, of course, great conversations happening about all the books and comics there as well. Just go to goodreads.com and search for Literary Treks. Guys, one of the things that has been so much fun about this show has been me, over the last four years, really getting the opportunity to dive into Star Trek comics. I had never really gotten into Star Trek comics before doing the show. And so the opportunity to kind of go back and and find new things and try new things has always been interesting. Uh, Sometimes it's been fantastic. Sometimes it's been the Avalon Rising Voyager comics. So uh, somewhere in between that, we find ourselves, uh, we are going to be talking about Star Trek Archives number four, Best of Deep Space Nine. and even before we just kind of start talking about the issues we've got here, guys, I will admit I was a little trepidatious because, you know, the early comics for the series, uh, especially the continuation of the series or at the beginning of the series, um, you know, we all know what Gold Key looked like uh, and because they didn't have a ton of info. So I wasn't really sure when I dove into this, seeing that we're going to be right at the beginning of Deep Space Nine, basically, how this was all going to play out at, did either of you feel like that? Maybe the first, second page here? I was a little little worried at the beginning because obviously this is season one, Deep Space Nine, very early on. Probably a lot of stuff just going by the writer's Bible and a little bit of what is aired. Luckily, no crewmen wearing Speedos and capes are to be seen in the pages of this comic. So I think we're already off to a good start with that. No bickering Bickleys. Involved in this comic whatsoever. Thank God. That should be a disclaimer on the cover, really. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe they'll appear in the Green Lantern crossover comic. That would work. That would actually fit. It would. (laughs) It would. Uh, But I don't want that to really happen. I'm just kidding. Um, No, I I felt the same way going into this. Um, I wasn't probably as worried. I didn't think it was going to be quite as bad as some of the earlier comics we've seen starting off the new series like the one we were just talking about with the bickering bickleys or whatever but um because at this point this is now about 1993 i think when these came out and i feel like at this time because i remember buying comics prior to this and i remember them being quite good the next generation and original series so coming into deep space nine i remember thinking they had their groove around this time so i wasn't quite as worried and i think it does show in this 
It's interesting uh, because I, I'm thinking of this this series, and I'm thinking of the next generation comics that we just recently talked about, <laughs> and the fact that they had the bickering Bickleys in there. Um, that's kind of what had me worried. Now, I want to say for this co- whole comic series, this has none of that in it. This this comic series is fantastic. Yeah, I just want to say right up front, I, I don't want people to think um, that we're getting on this comic. I, I just wanted everybody to know where it was starting because we've read some really interesting things uh, this year and the last few years. But I think this one, what it does is immediately captures the tone of the first season of Deep Space Nine perfectly. And we start off with a story called Stowaway. And guys, I have to say, right from the beginning, um, I'm a fan of the art. I, I really like this kind of uh, almost, it, it seems almost like pencil art. Uh, and it's, it's pretty detailed. And I got to say, all the characters look good. I mean, there's this wonderful splash page with all of the characters and who they are for Deep Space Nine. And I, I think for the most part, it's great. Yeah, I have to agree with a lot of that. This is an extremely professional effort by all the people involved here. They really have the look of the station down and, like you say, these characters. And there's so much from the first season of Deep Space Nine that they've captured so well in the tone here. At the start of this story, we immediately get Keiko and her class, and we get Jake and Nog shenanigans. Like, this is very first season. And even the crisis that's kind of enve- in, kind of enveloping the station. I mean, we had a lot of episodes in the first season where something weird starts happening all over the station. The station is put into immediate peril. I'm thinking like Babel and If Wishes Were Horses, kind of weird events that are happening. And this must be, you know, this has to be resolved by the end and the whole station's kind of in peril. It has a very first season feel to it. I'm really loving this. Yeah, exactly. I think when the first page you see the characters, they they introduce the characters in the very first page and they all look the likeness of the actors that played on the show. So right then and there, I was sold. And then you open it to a two page stowaway with the station and the wormhole in the background. And again, it looks really good. And it gets even better because by the time we get to the next page, like you said, there's Keiko in the class and in just a couple of panels, we get to see a pissed off Keiko. And I'm like, this really is Deep Space Nine. She's pissed off about something. And that's just incredible. Ah, oh, Jake and Nog, dang those two. <laughs> <laughs> at least O'Brien's safe in this one. <laughs> right, she's not mad at O'Brien. So they got a little off on their character on that one. <laughs> they missed the boat on that. Or they missed the ship on that. Well, and, and what's interesting here is is just it, it's such a classic Star Trek story that something small that kind of happens in the beginning creates a problem later on. And, you know, the fact that this class, Keiko's, is on a field trip in one of Dax's science offices and seeing around the lab and, you know, Jake and Nog are doing what teenage boys do and they're playing around with things they shouldn't and... They end up breaking a couple of things in beakers, and everybody thinks, oh, it's okay. The rest of the story comes out of this one little incident, and I think it's just a really nice thing that, again, like you were saying, Dan, it's so first season, Deep Space Nine, where something puts the station in peril, and it's the smallest thing, but we don't know how to fight it. And I have to say, the fact that this is growing mold is awesome. Yeah, really interesting. And, you know, something that would be pretty difficult to show on screen. So already it's using a familiar type of situation, but in a way that you couldn't do on the show, really using the medium of the comic to have something really cool happening. Uh, And of course, as we get into the story, after Jake and Nog kind of do their thing, we get what looks to be Captain John Tesh of the science vessel here docked at Deep Space Nine. I was thinking that the whole time. I kept waiting for him to be sitting at a piano and start like uh, telling me how it was going to be great tonight. And he was taking requests and dedication hour. <laughs> 
Yeah, I I was actually surprised when I first saw it. I was like, that looks like John Tesh. And then it's like the next panel. Yeah, that is John Tesh, which made sense because he's a big Star Trek fan. He was actually in an episode of The Next Generation. I remember when that episode premiered and they they actually reported on Entertainment Tonight and showed him getting in Klingon makeup because it's the episode where the uh, Worf was on the holodeck and the Klingons are stabbing him with those sticks and he's like, going, mm. one of those Klingons is John Tesh because he's a huge Star Trek fan. So obviously the, the people working on this comic recognized that in him and said, well, why don't we make him, what is it, Captain Johnson? So Captain Johnson Johnson is played by John Tesh in this episode. <laughs> I thought that was really great. To this day, I can't still can't tell which Klingon he is, but here he's unmistakable. Yeah, I I feel like they have done him justice. What I love is is kind of really cool about this whole storyline is that this science vessel has come and it looks just like the Grissom because all the science vessels in the Federation look like the Grissom, but it's come back from the wormhole and um, a famous archaeologist. Uh, Dr. Wembley has been on this expedition and they found some artifacts in the Delta Quadrant and he's asking him, Captain John Tesh, I mean Captain Johnson, to uh, lock these up and make sure they're safe. And then the mayhem really starts when O'Brien takes this chest of goodies and runs into the mold. That sounds so funny. <laughs> that's that's so I, weird. I'm just that's exactly what happens. He runs into the mold, guys. He opens the door and gets attacked by mold. Okay. Sure. So yeah, of course this immediately makes them think that the uh, artifacts are kind of the catalyst for what's happening here. And what I thought was really cool is they do make reference to a very early Deep Space Nine episode, Culus where they say, well, remember what happened the last time we had some artifacts from the ga- from the Gamma Quadrant? You know, hijinks ensued. Looks like it's happening again. Well, I, well, I also want to know why they even feel like Deep Space Nine needs to hold on to their artifacts from the ship. That's like, here, keep these safe for us. And then they just sit on the ship <laughs> that's in, you know, space dock there. I don't really get why the, they brought the artifacts on for the space station to hold on to it for them. Did you get it's for 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 plot related <laughs> anomaly reasons? <laughs> I like that. I like that. Um, I, I think what's so interesting here, too, is the way that this plays together, because you end up having this mystery with the science vessel and uh, Captain Johnson and Dr. Wembley happening you end up having this mystery with the mold and then you actually bring in the Cardassians as well and it again it really feels like that early Deep Space Nine where like nothing can go Cisco's way like mold gives you a bad day you know I mean it, it's it's a really interesting plot line that they're they're weaving here and I think it's a lot of fun. Like, I really enjoy this storyline, the stowaway. Now, I don't know if it needs to be two issues long because I feel like there's a lot of filler in here of, like, um, Captain Johnson stonewalling about uh, Dr. Wembley, Dr. Bashir going to try and talk to Garrick about things. But the actual base storyline of the boys accidentally causing mayhem mold mayhem <laughs> is is actually kind of fun you know because it, it's it's very star trekky that two seemingly innocuous things put together could could cause something like this when you have a reaction from something from the other side of space and all that it's it's really interesting yeah this whole kind of diversion the plot takes with captain johnson having I guess, lied about the fact that Dr. Wembley is alive in order to make sure he gets credited for the work or something. Like, talk about the weirdest reason to put your entire Starfleet career in jeopardy. Like, this, this, that whole story, I was confused by the end of it because I was like, okay, what was the big, huge conspiracy he, re- he was covering up here? That's weird to me. Because... If he wanted the doctor to get credit for it, even though the doctor passed away, why he couldn't he just tell everyone that the doctor discovered this and it should be honored in his name? He passed away before it could be brought back to Federation space. 
instead of doing a whole cover up to pretend that he's still alive so he could get credit for it. I don't even know how he thought he was going to pull that off. But I mean, it was an interesting story. I mean, I, th- I, I enjoyed it. And I agree with you, Matt. It was I, I did feel like two issues may have been a little too much. I did feel like there was filler, but it may have been a little too much to fit into one issue at the same time. So you couldn't write an issue and a half, but um, yeah, there were times I thought, okay, we're here. We're, we're still trying to fight the mold again, you know, and we're going back to this doctor and whoever else. And we're talking about the mold again. And it was really, the mold was getting old. <laughs> well, what what's interesting about part one is the fact that it does end with the cliffhanger of the Cardassians arriving and of course, then the question becomes, you know, is this one of those incidences where this was left by the Cardassians on purpose, you know? Uh, and I think, again, like season one, that's definitely something we could see the Cardassians doing, leaving the station, leaving something that seemed innocuous that would turn into a full out mold fest. And, you know, destroy the crew so that the Cardassians could have their station back. So I think that part, again, every time it kind of starts to pull itself away, it comes back with a thing that reminds you of season one. And I think that's where the real strength, especially in these first two issues, lie. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, yeah, moving on to the second issue, Old Wounds. This I found was a really interesting story. Uh, There are a few things that, you know, in 2020 hindsight don't really work with the timeline for Deep Space Nine, but you want to talk about a story that I think really is echoed in later Deep Space Nine stories. There's a lot of threads here that the writers of this comic kind of um, grasped onto here that later writers in Deep Space Nine would take up as well. Uh, for example, like I was thinking a lot of Maru, Kira's uh, mother with Gul Dukat. Mm-hmm. In t- with um, wrongs darker than death or night. Yeah. yeah. So basically this Cardassian warlord who was born on Bajor and commanded uh, Terok Nor for a while comes back to the station because there's a Cardassian ritual that you visit the planet of your birth before you're about to die. And he was known as the Butcher of Bajor. So some very... Uh, very dark things come up surrounding this character. Really interesting story, I thought. Yeah, as soon as it started off, the age of this Cardassian is very, very old. And he was born on Bajor during the occupation. Well, the occupation was only about 50 years ago. So he's a really, really old 50-year-old Cardassian. But at the same time... Hey, he lived a hard and, life. I mean, he makes Keith Richards look like a oh child. Oh my gosh, <laughs> yes, like a little baby. But no, so then I thought, well, I don't know, and maybe this is... I don't know if this fits into everything else. I haven't thought that much about it, but maybe Cardassians age faster than other races. They yeah, just, you know, trying to make it fit in. So it's possible. I mean, we've seen, you know... Klingon children grow pretty fast too, so it, why not Cardassians? Um, but it was it. I I will say I like this a little better than the first one. I like the first story that we were just discussing, and then I got to this one, which is a little shorter of a story, and I liked it even better because we started to delve in a little more about the Cardassians and their relationships with the Bajorans and the occupation and and Kira dealing with. Um, with her hate of the Cardassians and Cisco putting her in order of like, you know, we've, we've got to be accepting and I'm not, and I don't accept everything. Trust me on this. I've got it, you know? Um, so I thought the characters were portrayed very accurately to the series. It, it was one of the things that was really so fascinating about the issue was, as you said, Dan, it is really foreshadowing a lot of things that they will cover on Deep Space Nine. And they will get into that period with the occupation. Uh, they will get into the idea of a Bajoran woman, you know, marrying a Cardassian and what that's like. Um, they will get into all of these things. And I think it's really interesting because it's almost as if these writers have a much better insight into the world of Star Trek than I would say those early writers of the TNG comics. 
you know, we really see uh, some characters and some character decisions and everything about this just feels more organic. And maybe that's because, you know, Deep Space Nine comes after the next generation and a lot of more people have a lot more experience with Star Trek and understanding where these characters are at that point. But not only that, this really does, again, it, it fits within the continuum of Deep Space Nine, where it's going to go, the darker tone to some of the stories, and the trauma to which they're talking about here with the Bajoran occupation. There's, this story is, is really well done. Um, it doesn't fit timeline-wise, like you said, Bruce, but I don't really care because what they're doing with the characters in the storyline is really fascinating. That's exactly right. I actually made, I, I started this list of things that were, you know, not in continuity with this story. Like, oh, that, that can't be right. He can't be that old. The occupation was only this long. And well, maybe if you change that line to he was born on Bajor before the occupation or something. And then, yeah, I got halfway through the story and I literally crumpled that up and threw it out because you're absolutely right. I don't care. This story is good enough that it makes me totally forget about that stuff because, yeah, it's a great story. And so many ideas that come into play later on, like, you know, Odo's time on the station and, and his views towards justice and things past and necessary evil. There's so many episodes that this made me think of while I was reading it. And, uh, you know, talk about getting the tone of Deep Space Nine right. This one nailed it. Yeah, and it definitely feels like first season. And it, it, it it's a credit to the writers. Uh, and Mike Barr actually was the writer. He's written previous Star Trek series even before this. So he had a hand in this universe for quite a while. But, you know, it's credit to him that he comes up with ideas that uh, we see the show ending up using similar ideas later on. So it just shows what a good writer he is. Well, and and what was really cool about this whole story was that where it put Kira, you know, Kira has a vendetta against this guy because he killed one of her friends right in front of her. And what was great about the storyline was watching Kira put that aside to start to do her duty as an officer in the Bajoran militia and an attache to Starfleet. That's what I thought was really neat about this story is it's really capturing that transition for Kira from being the angry rebel to the more, you know, diplomatic diplomat. She will never be a full-on diplomat, but when you look at the character arc for Kira in Deep Space Nine, it's always so fascinating because, you know, she goes from being just somebody who's so angry at the Cardassians and hates them so much to being somebody who helps liberate the Cardassians in the end. Full circle we're talking about here. Um, and I, I think that this really fits so well into that, that, yeah, Mike Barr does a fantastic job of really projecting into the future almost of where we're going to see Kira go to. And, you know, she does kind of lose her cool a little bit here with the Cardassian uh, on the station. And, and, you know, I, I can't imagine that you wouldn't uh, at one point, but for the most part, she handles this so well, even with the person who turns out to be this guy's wife. It was her friend who stood next to her while he executed their other friend. And now she's married to this, what Kira thinks of as a butcher. And she treats her with respect and, and a lot more, honor than i mean especially early kira would have so i just again this is really great writing yeah i agreed completely with that uh it really pulled me in I, I i did find that the ultimate kind of resolution to the murder mystery was a little bit lackluster but the story that brought us there was good enough that again that's something that i was able to totally forgive see that's funny because i also I was enjoying the fact that it was a murder story with somebody with a vendetta against somebody where they didn't really commit the murder. It was a hologram that did it. And I found that was really unique because I don't think we've ever seen that in Star Trek before. Mm -hmm. Somebody using the holodeck, a holodeck character to murder somebody else. That's fascinating. Yeah, I, I did really, I, do, I should clarify, I did really like the mechanics of it. 
uh, it was kind of more the motivation behind it and that sort of thing. I was yeah. like, eh, yeah. that kind of fell flat a little bit, a little anticlimactic. But but yeah, no, that's true. Fair enough. The the hologram committing the murder thing was a really cool angle for sure. I just I, remind me never to go into uh, a holodeck program programmed by anyone other than myself because this could happen to you. So guys, beware. Uh, yeah. The more you know. <laughs> well, uh, the next uh, two issues are, are another duology that we get here called Emancipation. And I have to say, this was I, this is classic Star Trek. And classic Deep Space Nine to be dealing with uh, a very dark subject, the subject of slavery and the Prime Directive and what is Starfleet's responsibility to people that they come across, what they can do and what they can't do. And I just, I really have to say, uh, for all the comic series that we read, I, I, you know, the, the graphic novels we've picked up, man, I feel like so far this one's batting almost a thousand. So this is pretty cool. In the first season of Deep Space Nine, we get a few different types of stories. We get the crazy thing threatens the entire station. We get the something to do with the Cardassian Bajoran politics and Deep Space Nine's past. And we get the someone or something comes through the wormhole and shenanigans ensue. And so in these first three stories, we get all of those. <laughs> you know, they they really got the tone of Deep Space Nine down really well here for the first season for sure so yeah this big huge ship comes through the wormhole and it turns out it's a group of escaped slaves and cisco is kind of torn as to what he can do they are trying to escape but in his words and i i i kind of don't really buy his angle on this because they're actively asking for help but you know, if they come from a culture that condones slavery, who are they to oppose that? Well, okay. All right. I'll go with it. It's it's a very Star Trek thing. It kind of reminds me of the idea of, uh, you know, the the Federation doesn't oppose the Ferengi. It doesn't not do business with them and that kind of stuff. It They just wouldn't be allowed to be a part of the Federation because of their treatment of women, that kind of stuff. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're going to try and impose their values on them. And so, yeah, it was the very gray area for Star Trek of, well, we have these values, we think they're better, but we're not going to tell you you're wrong, even though you clearly are. Uh, so it, it is that, that kind of area where Star Trek has always had to walk that line. And I think the way that Cisco tries to walk it here makes a lot of sense and makes it really interesting to try and s him to find a way around that. Mm -hmm. Like he keeps trying to find a way around that and um, it keeps not working out as well as he wants it to. And that's what makes this story really interesting. I guess where it falls down for me and like I feel like if a Ferengi woman came to a Starfleet captain and said, I request asylum in the Federation, I don't think she'd be sent back to Ferenginar. That's I could be wrong that, about that. That's how I felt that, too. Exactly. Yeah. Dan, same thing. I mean, I was, you know, this... They are they're obviously a warp capable society. They're they're out in space. The spaceship shows up and they ask for asylum and well, no, we we can't give it to you. You're not members of the Federation. We don't want to interfere with your uh customs. And and I was just I, I don't know. I mean, would they would Cisco really decline that request? But then as I read it later, it almost sounded like it, he was saying, you know, I, I am declining it now, but I'm not going to say I'm not going to accept it later. I almost felt like he was like, you know, we just got to have to test the waters here before we can actually agree to something. So I felt like maybe he was trying to feel that out. Well, this one reminded me of the Tosk episode, you know, in season one. And that is the answer that they give. We can't interfere with this culture, you know, and Tosk is a being who's created to be hunted. So, you know what I'm saying? Like, they don't interfere there. They don't interfere here. So at least they're being consistent. Yeah, uh, th the answer is wrong, again, I, in the sense that you wouldn't grant asylum to people who are asking it from you. Um, and they're being, you know, they're, they're slaves. Uh, I, I guess, and this is where the logic all flows together. I, 
I guess the Federation feels that, I mean, but if we start to do that, I mean, who are we to destabilize an entire society? You know, shouldn't they find out for themselves that slavery is bad? And if we take it away from them prematurely, will they really learn the lesson? I mean, all of those questions, I'm sure that they're asking it. Again, because you don't have a standard for your morality other than what you think is better. It's kind of hard to go around and say other people should do it this way. Like, you have to do it this way. I don't know. It, it's It's... I I actually did think of the Tosk example as well. And I think the big difference, you know, not to just turn this into a, a debate about what Cisco does. The prime directive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, f- we'll figure that one out in an afternoon, I'm sure. But, you know, the Tosk example, the difference there is that's what Tosk wanted as well. I mean, and and you could argue, yeah, he was raised to believe that and he was bred specifically for that. But Tosk did say what I want to do is be back out there. And, uh, you know, these people are actively coming and saying, we've escaped, we want freedom. And I, yeah, I just, I feel like Cisco is either unnecessarily kind of hedging his bets or being really, I don't know. It just, it feels problematic to me. (laughs) I don't know. You know, it just, it doesn't feel quite right. No, I agree. And but at the same time, like I said earlier, I'm just wondering if he was testing the waters because at the same time, I probably have an argument of he was too readily uh, accepting them. That if a race just shows up and says, hey, we're running away from someone that's oppressing us and we want asylum, take us. OK, sure. We, we just we open our door to anybody. No, we have to kind of check things out and see, would we be violating the prime directive? And maybe that's not directly addressed in that manner in this comic but it makes me think that that's probably what would be going on in cisco's mind or any other federation officer that would have to deal with this situation well and i think that's the thing that i feel like he is doing because the moment somebody says hey we need asylum well but they don't know who these people are or where they come from or or what their culture's like and so in this way of of cisco not immediately granting the asylum He's able to parse out the situation, figure out what's going on. And I would say through his actions, this group figures it out for themselves. And I thought that was kind of interesting that the resolution here is this group, through struggle, through strife, through some death, they are actually able to come to an agreement together that will change their society forever through their interactions with, I think, the crew of Deep Space Nine, but also just what they're experiencing. And, you know, this raises tons of great questions like, what about freedom? Are we really made for freedom? Are we made to be slaves? Like, uh, you know, like what happens when you give people freedom who have never had it? And, did you know, how do you know how to live that way? I mean, it's just... It, there are a lot of great questions I, I loved about this this series uh, of, of issues, th- these two issues here, Emancipation, because there's a lot of really deep philosophical stuff that's happening, and that's so Star Trek, to bring up those issues, but not necessarily answer the questions, just leave them hanging. Like, I don't really know what those answers, but hopefully you'll think about them. Yeah, I, I did really like that. You know, the resolution kind of comes about not because of the heavy hand of of Starfleet wielded by Cisco. That was that was kind of I do have to admit getting to that point was a good thing that the story does for sure. Um you know, for the most part I enjoyed this story with the exception of a few little you know minor problems that I've kind of articulated, but you know, on the whole it is a really interesting story that kind of examines this culture and again, it it's a very first first or second season of deep space nine episode you know tosk uh captive pursuit uh the um the one where the screens come through the wormhole in season two like it's it's very it very much feels in that similar vein and i really enjoyed it for that the only problem i had with this is that at times i couldn't tell if we had one of the slaves talking or one of the slavers or which one of the slaves was talking or which one of the slavers it, sometimes it got a little confusing for me. I had to take a moment and really look at the art and say, wait, okay, who's talking again? Is this 
yeah okay it's that guy okay no this is his wife or the woman or whatever so the, outside of that though i i thought this was solid i thought it was solid even more so than the the previous two and the previous two were really good i thought this one really was top notch well, I, I think that our opinions just keep growing, so I'll be interested as we jump into hostage situation to see if we've reached the best of the series or not. So what do you guys think about this one? I really liked uh, kind of the change in artwork for this one. I've really liked the artwork up to this point, and, but I really like this as well uh, for very different reasons. So first of all, the look of it was really striking to me. And some of the um, artistic choice choices here, for example, when Odo turns into what I thought was a huge bear, but it turns out to be a Vulcan Salot. Uh, yeah, a very different looking Salot. Those are from North Vulcan. <laughs> the other ones we've seen are from Southern Vulcan. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, some really cool stuff here. Uh, so first of all, I'll say that, yeah, it, it was really, it was a fascinating, new, different take on the look than we've seen in the previous stories, for sure. Well, I love that uh, Odo points out that the Salots are, uh, they possess a pronounced resistance to the effects of Klingon disruptors. That's something we've never learned in canon. So you can't shoot one of these things with a Klingon disruptor. That's very important to know. I wonder if that's in Dayton's travel guide. <laughs> <laughs> make sure to bring a federation phaser not a disruptor <laughs> which is that is a really good travel guide i'm still reading it i love it um this issue uh, the art i like the artwork better in the previous issues they felt more like the art you'd see in comics but also it was i re, like i said i was reading the star trek comics at that time and the previous uh issues felt more like the comics of that day this was a little different i so i the, the art didn't work for me as well uh and odo at times looks a little weird <laughs> but um you know this one was okay i just can't get i don't it wasn't bad the problem is it's so short it's it's seven pages and it's trying to do a a, a quick story but it's not a silly story it's it, 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 it's not a fun story it, it really involves these klingons and they, you know, are are going to basically murder one of their members for a crime that they did. And then we find out later, well, that's not necessarily even true. Yeah, I, I felt it like I felt that this one is a very typical Star Trek style story, but not a typical Deep Space Nine story. They really fell away from the tone of the previous stories and. You know, that's one thing the Deep Space Nine writer's guide always had was we don't if a, if a story that we do can be done on the next generation, we don't want to do it. And this one felt like a very generic Star Trek story, you know, kind of bring a prisoner on board under false pretenses. Something happens. There's a hostage situation and it all gets resolved. And in the course of that resolution, like I had to reread that last page like three or four times because I could not figure out exactly what the heck happened there. Uh, same thing. Same thing here. Yeah. Like I flipped the next page and it's that, that pencil drawing of deep space nine. And I'm like, Oh, it's over. What happened? I, I did. That was really annoying to me. No, I'm, I'm right there with you guys. Uh, I feel like this one is very quick and it seems a little rushed uh, for a story and it, it's just, it's okay. You know, I mean, it's not awful. It's just not great. And, and I think what was frustrating is that, you know, before this, we had really been getting quality stories. And, um, you know, this one was kind of a weird one to end on. So, um, yeah, I don't have a ton to say about it because it's just, there's not really a lot to say about it. The resolution is very quick. And like you said, Dan, um, I, I also had to read through that last page a couple of times just to kind of figure out what the heck was that's going really on, interesting so. so all three of us had to reread that that's that's very telling <laughs> very telling yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah so all of that together for you guys you know this uh star trek archives number four best of deep space nine what do you guys think uh ratings wise Okay, so ratings-wise, I think that these comics really hold up to the first season of Deep Space Nine. 
Uh, they were not silly. It wasn't one of these things where I was rolling my eyes. The artwork was good. The writing was good. As each story went along, I thought they just kept getting better. So um, I don't want to give it a really high rating because at the same time, it's like the first season of Deep Space Nine. And I know what comes later is going to be even better. So when I put it on that scale, I'm going to say three and a half out of five globs of mold. Nice. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I I feel very similar to you, Bruce. I, I, when I started that first story and, you know, you immediately see Keiko and her students and Jake and Nog and the amazing artwork. You know, I was like, this is great. This is really, really good. And then it started to be mold taking over the station. And I was a little worried. I'm not going to lie. But they made a really good story out of it. And as I went, like you said, they just keep getting better and better. A little bit of, you know, narrative choices that feel a little out of place with some of the characters. But much less so than comparable comics set in the early days of previous series. So you know, they have a really strong set of stories here that are very evocative of the first season of Deep Space Nine. It's really unfortunate that it ends on that Klingon story that just kind of fizzles out by crashing into a force field, I think, at the end. But, uh, you know, for the most part, I did really enjoy this. And I was really kind of going back and forth between a three and a four star rating or three and a four flowers that grow in the dark rating um but yeah i think i'm kind of with you bruce i would settle on a 3.5 maybe 3.75 somewhere in there it's it's yeah i don't want to quite go to a four but it's not quite a three either so yeah definitely a very solid effort here bah humbug you guys bah humbug i'm calling it um with all the comics that we've read that are so awful, uh, it just feels so out of place, especially with the, the TNG ones we read and uh, some of the ones we read for TOS. And uh, just these, for the first time, uh, you know, since modern comics that, you know, like by IDW, these felt like actual stories that could have happened in the show. And, you know, when it comes to, to Star Trek comics, I think that's what I want to feel the most. Like, it could actually happen on the show that the characters feel realistic. And for the most part, all the main cast feel right. All the storylines feel right. And so, for me, this is, this is you know, a good four out of five John Tesh's <laughs> as a captain. So, I this, this really is... Um, a well done comic and I would highly recommend it to anybody who does like deep space nine and just wanted to experience more early deep space nine stories. Uh, you know, it, it does unfortunately lose a whole star because you know, the ending comic of hostage situation is, is lame. You know, it's just not a good way to end and it does kind of put a little bit of a sour taste in your mouth, but Hey, if you get this and you don't read that at the end, you'll end on emancipation part two. And I think, you just may come away with this as a 4.5. Well, a few kind of mixed reactions to this comic, but I think overall very, very positive. Uh, I, I love when we read something like this and, you know, it kind of almost seems to take a couple of different tacks. Either it's so absurd as to be completely laughable or a very, very professional good effort like this one. And I really think this was the latter of the two. Uh, You know, I maybe didn't quite give this one a four, but I still really, really admired the effort here and really enjoyed this one. And it gives me hope that since we had a comic with John Tesh, that maybe one day we'll have one with Mary Hart and the rest of the old Entertainment Tonight crew in there. Entertainment Tonight, (laughs) you know, like, yeah. Oh, I guess you remember those days. Um it is really funny that, you know, you'd think Star Trek used to be so big, it would be on Entertainment Tonight. It'd be their lead story. You know, I remember when Generations was coming out, and that was their big topic of conversation. Kirk and Picard meet, you know. That's uh, where I got I'm a lot of my Star Trek news back then was on Entertainment Tonight. That was the place oh, to totally, go. Oh, totally, yeah. 
I, man, I tell you what, John Tesh, he'll give it to you straight. Because they're both Paramount, so. so they were on the same lot. So they were always covering That's true. It. Yeah, you're very right. So, goodness, this is this is so much fun to be able to talk about this stuff with you guys. I really do love uh, getting to do this. And, and what I love, most of all, was that these comics, I felt like, in the end, were worth talking about. I mean, I think that they were good. Um, and it didn't feel like, oh my gosh, why are we talking about this? This, as you said, Dan, is absurd. (laughs) This was not absurd, so thank goodness. And we have amazing associate producers here through Patreon who help make sure that the network and Literary Checks keeps coming to each week. We'd want to thank Ken Tripp, Brandon Shamatola, and Bruce Gibson, great guys who understand the fact that Trek FM is huge, and we definitely can't do this without their help. There's just no way we can put over 20 different shows, special feeds. We had over 330,000 downloads the last month, and that's just huge. And we're talking over 9 terabytes worth of information going to you guys. So we definitely need help to keep bringing that to you. It it does cost us a lot. So go to patreon.com slash trekfm, and you can see how you can be part of the team. All the great content keeps coming to you each and every week. Uh, now, Dan, when you're not trying to find a way to get mold off your boot, where can we find you? Oh, man, it just it sticks there and then it takes over the whole city and I get kicked out of another place. Ugh. Keep it out of your new house. That's all I can say. Yeah, tell me about it. You don't need mold. Well, when I'm not dealing with that unfortunate problem... You can find me on YouTube and Facebook under Kurtrats Productions. You can find me on Twitter at Kurtrats, on Instagram at Kurtrats47. And of course, you can find me on the Babel Conference talking about Star Trek pretty much all the time. Bruce, when you're not turning into a kind of odd looking Vulcan Salot, where can we find you? Well, I wouldn't be running away from Klingon disruptors because they don't affect me. Uh, You can find me on Twitter at admiral underscore rex and you can also find me on the podcast called the star wars report and matthew when you are not growing flowers in the dark where can people find you you know it's really hard thing to grow flowers in the dark i end up with dirt everywhere and just it's just awful but uh when i'm not doing that or trying to post pictures of them on instagram at m rushing you can find me tweeting about things usually not garden related at Matt rushing zero two. You can also find me here on the network on the orb with Chris Jones, where we talk about deep space nine all the time. So it's a great place to go. I'm also on the six Oh two club where we're talking about all things geeky throughout all the different franchises that we know and love. So make sure you check that out. It's a great place to go for non star Trek fun here on the network. Of course, you can always find me with, John Mills over there on Aggressive Negotiations, the Star Wars podcast. It's so much fun. We're over there on the Nerd Party Network at nerdparty.com. Of course, you can also find us on iTunes, so I hope you'll check that out. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And until next time, live long and read on. You call that light reading? To each his own, number one.